and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Thursday, February 27th, and this is a bonus episode. So if you're looking for a regular episode, a chitty chat chat episode, an episode where I'm talking about what I'm knitting and spinning and crocheting and all of those things, just go back to the YouTube channel and look for a numbered episode. This one is going to be a little bit, it's going to be more focused and less conversational. Um, so Thanks to folks who donate to the podcast via Patreon, PayPal, Ko-Fi, and all the other magical resources of the universe. I get to do a bonus episode every month. It's true. So thank you to those guys. Woohoo! Thanks, folks. You're amazing. Um, and this episode is going to be about hats. So my lovely friend Joanna, who is Knitspin Farm, who made this yarn for me. She spun this yarn for me. This is a Midas hat that I then knit with the magical fingering white three-ply yarn. Can we just take a break to understand that people are amazing? Okay, that's the break. Um, she suggested that I do a hat episode and I had just not occurred to me to do one before. Um, so, and then I put it out to y'all and you had amazing questions. So we're actually gonna do it in two parts. This part is gonna be like a Q and A sort of tips and tricks kind of section where we're going to talk about more um, of the the construction and technical aspects of hats and then the next time I'm going to do like a giant show and tell well giant I'm going to do a pretty hefty show and tell um, so that's the place where I'll talk about like favorite patterns um, patterns for yarns and things like that or you know weights of yarns and things like that so that'll happen on the next one my intention is to kind of time stamp this episode with questions or at least maybe sections that's probably more realistic um, with sections and then timestamps. So if you're curious about, for example, cast ons, you can go to find cast ons. Um, and that's, so that is my intention. So we'll be talking about um, yarn choice, needle choice, pattern choice. We'll talk about cast ons, brims, bodies, crowns, and then finishing. Um, so that is my intention today. I may not answer all the questions you've asked. I tried to keep track of everything, uh, but there were a few that were slightly beyond my l area of expertise. Expertise is a strong word. Um, I'm not, I'm like a local hat expert. Like in your neighborhood, I might be your hat expert, but I'm not a regional hat expert by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm just doing my best, um, which is to say that if I totally accept that I may be wrong about something, do not hesitate to point that out to me and to the rest of the folks in the universe. Uh, you can do that on the YouTube comments and we'll go from there. Okay? Okay. So, I used to be a person who had only one hat at a time. Confessions. Not only was I a person who only had one hat at a time, I was a person who was militantly only owning one hat at a time. Like, I thought it was quite ridiculous that people would own more than one hat. So from the time I was like 18 until about, mm, let's say the age, let's just say the age of 30-ish, I really was just like, I thought that was ridiculous to own more than one hat. Now I'm a person who probably has 30 hats, conservatively. <laughs> And I've probably knit um, 130 hats. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but I'm in the ballpark. Because now I'm a person who does wear them all the time. I wear them inside. I wear them during the winter pretty much. Well, this winter has been a little bit different because my internal temperature system is a little bit wackadoodle. But generally, I wear them from pretty much September through April all the time. Um, so it makes a sense to have more than one hat. I enjoy knitting them. They're fun. That's all the reason I have. I like them. Um, but yeah, so I do enjoy a hat. So let, it makes sense that I should do a hat episode. Hello. So let's just get into it. I feel like I'm struggling a little bit. Let's get into it. So yarn choice. Okay, so now I could not find this comment, but somebody, I remember reading the comment. Um, what, you know, somebody specifically asked about a sock head hat. And I saw another comment too where somebody commented that their hat brims get stretched out. I actually don't usually have that problem, especially on a sock head. Now, some of my um, garter hats and 
hats that have like a combination of ribbing and cabling. Um, that's sometimes a problem, but especially in a sock head hat, I would not expect your ribbing to get too loose. That surprises me. So the only thing I can think of is that it's a yarn issue. Um, some yarns just don't have as much memory as 100% wool. Um, now I have knit tons of hats with superwash yarn and not even had a problem. Um, but my only thought is maybe that it is like an alpaca blend or something like that, or maybe it's a combination of a superwash and an, and an alpaca, um, just because those yarns don't tend to have this memory. And memory is just that, that beautiful thing about wool that once it gets stretched out, it will remember its original state and come back to it. Now that can be problematic when you're doing lace and trying to stretch things out, but it's a lovely thing when you're trying to knit something that is elastic and that's gonna retain its shape over time. So my only thought to that is that, you know, if you're having an experience where your hat brims are getting stretched out, there's there's multiple things that could be happening. But a sock head hat, you know, that's the one that has like four inches of ribbing or something like that. It's fingering weight and it's two by two. So the only thing that I could think of that would cause that one to stretch out is maybe a fiber choice. It's also potentially a gauge issue. Um, you know, if your gauge is loose on that ribbing and ribbing is, is hard to keep firm, that's not an unusual problem to have. But those are the only two things I could think of for that specific hat that would cause a brim to stretch out. And so that's in general why when I'm knitting hats, I do try to knit them with wool uh, because it's just more likely to retain its shape. Now, certainly doesn't mean you can't knit a hat with another fiber, um, but you really want to be aware of the fiber's limitations um, or how it's going to behave when you're knitting. So like, for example, I would not knit a hat out of hemp or linen um, because they're just not going to, they're not going to retain their shape. They're going to stretch out over time. Cotton is the same way. Um, I don't enjoy knitting with those fibers because of the lack of elasticity, the lack of memory in them. Um, it doesn't mean that those fibers aren't valid and great, but just means that they present different challenges, especially in a garment like a hat. Um, and I don't have expertise in that neighborhood. So I don't know, I don't have good suggestions for, you know, I only like, for example, I only like cotton yarns. What's the best hat choice for me? I don't have expertise in that. So I apologize. That is one of my limitations. Um, I usually would not knit a hat out of anything less than at least 50% wool. But I, you know, superwash doesn't hold its shape as well. Um, and that is a reality of superwash. So, but I've never had problems with superwash hats that I could directly attribute to the yarn, or to the fiber choice, excuse me. Um, so, yeah. I would say that if you're using a superwash yarn, it is something to be aware of. So you may want to have a little bit less positive ease in your hat if you do positive ease in hats, or you may want to have, um, you know, you may want to make sure you're doing your ribbing on smaller needles, um, things like that, that might help with superwash. But generally I've not had that experience that it's, it's wildly problematic. Now that's could also be because of how I wear and or use my hats. Um, you know, I'm not running marathons in them. Disclosure. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm like living daily life in them. I'm, and I have a lot of them. That's the other thing. They have, um, they have time to take a break between wearing. So I usually don't wear the same hat every day. Um, and so that's probably a factor too, if you only are investing the time of, you know, and energy into one or two hats. So that's my thought on that. So then let's talk about needle choice. So, um, yeah. So folks asked about like what needles I use, um, but also uh, that has more than one, that encompasses more than one question, okay? So at the moment, I'm currently almost always using 16 inch circular needles when I knit hats. Um, but until about a year or two ago, I only used Magic Loop when I was knitting hats. And so let's talk about like the pros and cons of each. Okay. And, and Magic Loop, if you're not, sh if you're not aware, that's when you're using a longer circular needle and you have 
loops basically essentially either side and it allows you so let's just talk about magic loop here's some benefits of magic loop um a you don't have to invest in 16 inch cirques that's a great thing like if you're a sweater knitter or a shawl knitter you don't need to have 16 inch cirques it's another investment and the thing about that is you also don't need to have double points to finish the top or maybe two you know you can also use like two pairs of 16 inch cirques if you get to the top um so there's, you know, depending on what you regularly find yourself knitting and what needle supplies you have, it's a money saver in that way. Primarily the reason, well, that's not true. That was a big reason. <laughs> Secondarily, <laughs> I like to do magic loop on hats because you can easily try them on at any time. So a lot of people ask the questions about like, well, how do I try on a hat that I'm knitting to see if it fits well? Um, or like, for example, some people said, well, I don't want to knit a gauge swatch for a hat. That's ridiculous. I don't knit gauge swatches for hats. I feel you. Um, this is a great solution. When you have that hat brim on a 16 inch circular needle, you cannot tell. I mean, unless you're just very seasoned and not me. You cannot tell if that's going to be the right size. Now, you can obviously measure your gauge and see if that's correct. Uh, but it's just hard to tell if that's actually going to fit on your head properly. So Magic Loop is a fabulous way to check your hat at any time to see if you're close to wanting to do decreases to see how the brim works you can even you know if your family is is accepting of you you can even just tuck the sweat the ball of yarn into your shirt collar if god forbid you're wearing a bra at home i mean i know some of you like to wear a bra at home i still love you if you're still wearing a bra, you could tuck the ball, the ball of yarn that you're working from into your shirt and just wear it around the house for a little while. Um, that's going to give you a better idea about the heat of your head and how that's going to affect the yarn and all of that good stuff. So yay, Magic Loop. It's a wonderful thing for that. Now, excuse me. Why did I switch to 16 inch shirts? Um, so there's, there are benefits to 16 inch circular needles. One of those benefits is that um, I like to knit like Ricky hats, the ones that are all garter stitch. Uh, but because of the way I knit, specifically the way I purl, purling in the round is against my religion. It's a lot more effort to purl than it is to knit for me. And purling in the round is just really counter. It just goes against my grain. So you can knit garter stitch in the round without purling, but it involves doing short rows. It doesn't involve doing short rows. It involves doing wraps and turns at the beginning and end of each row. If you're curious about that, you can Google garter stitch in the round, no purl, knitting pipeline. Paula Emmons Seasley has a lovely technique video out there for you on YouTube. Excuse me. But it is so much easier to do that when you're on 16 inch circs because you don't have to like you know what I mean like it's just it's it's just easier to do that on a one circular needle versus the magic loop where you're having edges and you have to wrap something and then move that it's just much more convenient um I also think color work because I do stranded color work one yarn in each hand I find that color work is much easier on a 16 inch circular needle uh, because there's just less stopping there's less because, you know, you stop at the end of each point, right? So when you just have one yarn, that's not such a big deal. But when you have to kind of like reconfigure two yarns and you're holding your thing, that takes more time. Um, not only does it take more time, it's just more opportunities to stop and do something else for me in the way I my brain works. Like, so at the end of each section, it's just another time for me to check a phone or get lost in a program or pet the dog and get snoozy or whatever. <laughs> that last one is totally acceptable. Um, but so that slows me down. Um, so I find that knitting on a 16 inch circular needle, I am a slightly more productive knitter. I, I'm less likely to stop and start and stop and start. Um, and then also brioche is much easier for me on a 16 inch circular for a hat. Um, just because again, especially two color brioche, single color brioche, not so much, but two color brioche is much easier for me 
on a 60 inch circular because there's one less place that you're having to kind of like, oh wait, am I behind this or in front of this? Or, you know, it's just easier for me to manage on a 60 inch circular needle. Okay, okay. Of course, the downfall of that is that not only do you have to invest in a 16 inch circular needle, you have to invest in some way to finish the top. So either you need another 16 inch circular needle where you're you know, knitting with one on each side or you need to have double points um, or you can just magic loop the top. The crown decreases if you do that. That's often what I do because I just don't have that many double points um, in my house. So, but just something, you know, to be aware of. So, oh, and so then Shelly also asked um, about traveling loop, which is very similar to magic loop, um, except you can do it with a slightly shorter needle. So instead of um, having a long enough needle to have loops on either side, you can't, you just have the loop at the beginning of the round. So essentially you're only stopping once, which is a great alternative um, if, for example, you're doing one of those brioche or something like that, where you, or color work, um, the, the, the downside of doing traveling loop um, is that it can, depending on how you knit, I have trouble um, having a slightly, a, a pull at the beginning of the round. Um, but that's just me. It's not really a ladder, but it's somewhat similar. Like if you have trouble with laddering on Magic Loop, it's, I never have trouble with laddering um, on Magic Loop. I sometimes do on double points. Now I'm, I've gotten my gauge settled. That's pretty okay. Uh, but for some reason with the Magic Loop, I think just because you have more loop at one side um, than you would if you were just Magic Looping. I don't know. Also, I don't like traveling loop when you get small uh, because it exaggerates that even more and it's just fiddlier like because your your needle is longer on those longer cirques and it just does not work as well when you have fewer stitches um, it just physically doesn't work as well so okay okay and then pattern choice so again I'm going to do a large I'm going to do more of a pattern showcase in the next one but this kind of goes into fit a little bit so I thought there were quite a few questions about fit. So let's talk about that um, as it relates to pattern choice. Um, Christine asked for hats other than two by two rib that fit a wide range of sizes. Um, so what I suggest on that is um, either sideways garter. Sideways garter is lovely in that it is nice. It's not as elastic as rib, but it feels pretty darn good. Um, sideways garter is a great option. And um, Wooly Worm had, has quite a few sideways garters. There's other ones out there. Um, and if you don't know how to look for them on Ravelry, when you're doing your pattern, you know, when you're doing an advanced search, there is an option under, I think it's under construction, where you can put in sideways as a construction. So if you're on the category, you're under category, you're under category, you're under accessories, you're under hat, you're under all hats. Then you go to attributes, construction, okay? And if you go under attributes and construction, you can either look for hats that go top down or you can look for hats that go sideways. So if you're not sure about how to look for those, that's it's attributes, construction. Um, so hats that are garter in this sideways garter, I think are a great option and an alternative to ribbing. Um, and then of course, folded brims, brims. Like if you don't want to do ribbing watch cap all the way up ribbing, because that's assume, I'm assuming that's what you meant. It was like the watch cap where it's ribbing all the way up, but really folded brims fit a ton of folks. Um, and you know, and by that I just mean a hat that has a brim that you can either wear unfolded, and she can that wearer can wear it slouchy, or it's a folded brim, and then it's a, a closer like a, a closer fit. Um, and those really have, and again, usually those brims are ribbed, but I think those are a great option for folks who are looking for like for example, that's kind of like that. The br folded brim is what I do for most of my charity knitting uh, because I just feel like it's a pretty flexible thing. And really, like if you look at hat circumferences, even between like a teen and an adult, 
or a child and adult, there's not a huge amount of difference. And most knitted fabric, again, if you're talking about wool and you're talking about not knitting to like bulletproof gauge, right? So not a super rigid gauge, but just a nice flexible gauge, you already have, even in stockinette, you have a good amount of elasticity knit into that hat already. Um, and you're looking at something like, you know, let's say an average hat is 20 inches. Well, if you've got a good 10% flexibility, that's a two inch margin. And usually the only difference between a small hat and an adult hat, or excuse me, a small hat and a large hat is usually only about two inches, if that. Like sometimes it's 20 and 22. So you have a lot more flexibility than you might think just because you're knitting a knitted garment, right? Um, or knitted fabric. So I would say, just go with it. But sideways garter's good. Also, it's just fun to knit. Okay, and so then World Peas asked, how do you make a hat for to fit a particularly sized head? And that's, I would go right back to that other argument of like, it's a small, medium, large, you know, like it's not a sweater. People don't generally have wildly different configurations of head shape. Um, just, you know, put it out there. And it's a hat. Like, that's the beautiful thing. If you're not too precious about it, if you say to yourself, like if it's a loved one especially, if you say to yourself, I'm willing to knit this person five hats because I love them and fun, hats are fun, then you can knit them a hat. And if it doesn't fit quite right, then that one goes in the charity bin or gets cycled around to the other family members. And then you just knit them another one based on that. I mean, I, I guess that's not like them. I know we don't all have endless amounts of time to knit and create and make. Um, but it's fun. So maybe make them more than one hat. Okay. Um, oh, so Tara asked about hats and glasses. That's a good one. Um, when you wear specs, your glass, your hat typically does touch your glasses. Um, my husband is a fan of wearing his hats completely parallel, like the brim is parallel to the ground, parallel to the horizon. He does not wear, I only wear my hats tilted. Right? So when you're wearing them this way, I think there's less issue with them touching your glasses, right? Um, but when I wear mine, they definitely do touch my glasses. Now, I tend to not really have too much trouble. I would say overall, if you're having trouble with your glasses pushing, or your hat pushing your glasses down, you probably want to go to a finer weight yarn. Because I do notice it more in my heavier hats that they tend to want to push down a little bit. Um, it might also be that you need to um, just knit a slightly smaller circumference uh, because obviously if your hat has positive ease and it's not touching your head then the only place it has to mount is on your glasses arm right like that's going to be the only thing that stops it from sliding down until this part touches you know what I mean so if you're wearing a heavyweight hat and your brim is not is not being stopped by your head circumference then the only thing that's going to stop it is your glasses. And then just all that weight is going to be on your glasses. So it's a two point suggestion, a lighter weight hat, um, or you might just need to snug up your brim just a little bit. That's what I would think. And then let's see, ba -ba 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 -ba. inspired by fiber asked about modifying patterns for like if you have an adult hat that you like and you want to knit it for a child and vice versa. Um, I don't have great experience in that, so I will admit that right off the bat. Uh, but generally, I just would change the, the, the gauge of the hat. So like if it's a kid's hat and you want to knit it for an adult, you know, go up a yarn weight, maybe two, and then the con opposite of that um, if you're going down. That's the easiest way is just to change the gauge. And again, usually you're not looking at a huge difference for a child's head circumference versus adults. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Um, for example, let's just say, like if I go from a sport, a fingering weight sock to a sport weight sock, I go from 72 inches 
stitches to 64 stitches and that generally works for me. So that is what an 88% different like that's a t depending on how you look at it. <laughs> it's 12% right so like going from one to the other is about a 12% change. Um, so you know if you're looking at going from one hat or from one weight to the other. And again, that's just me. That's just a general thing. Uh, but let's say it's about a 10% difference. Then that's going to be the difference between like an 18 inch circumference hat for a kid versus a 20 for an adult. So I would say about one um, weight jump. General suggestion. Okay. Okay. And then Yarn Closet asks specifically about like, okay, if I want to go from fingering, I have a fingering weight hat that I love, but I want to knit it in sport weight. So for example, I love the Midas hat. It's a fingering weight hat, but I have sport weight and I want to make it. What should I do? Well, my technical answer is that you just measure your difference in gauge. The other thing you could do is just look at the ball bands and measure that difference in gauge and see what percentage it is. And if, for example, it's 10%, and if, for example, this hat is 130 stitches, it's not, I'm just making a number up, then I probably need 10% fewer stitches. I need 13 fewer stitches. Now that's gonna make your crown decreases off, obviously but you can work on that when you get there. You can just kind of, you know, look at, well, you know how to do that, right? Like, you just look at, just kind of jump in the water where you are. So like, if for example, that when, you, when the, the first pattern is 180 stitches and you only have now 160, let's say, just jump into the decreases when it's down to about 160 stitches. You might have to fudge the first round, like, you know, might do like a cleanup round where you lose a couple stitches before you start doing your crown decreases, but that's not a big deal. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. Cast-ons. What is my favorite cast-on? Generally, 95% uh, of the time, probably, I use a German twisted cast-on for my hats. So it's a long tail cast on and it's just slightly, it's a little bit more flexible than like the traditional um, long tail cast on. So you do, it is a twisted one. So you have to knit into the back of the stitches, but that's not ever been uncomfortable for me. So that's the one I use almost exclusively. I do like um, a tubular cast on sometimes. And that's mostly if it's a heavier weight wool, I don't find them to be as dramatic on like, for example, a fingering weight wool. Uh, but if your hat is really, if your if your yarn is heavier and thicker, then sometimes that tubular cast on can just look lovely and squishy and plump. Um, and I use the one that Jared Flood talks about on his, like if you, if you Google Jared Flood tubular provisional cast on, or even just Jared Flood tubular cast on, um, it's one where you cast on like half the number of stitches you need at provisionally and then you increase. So it's a little bit trickier to do in the round if you're using a 16 inch circ. In fact, it's it's not just tricky, it's ridiculous. Uh, but if you're using, um, and it is a flat cast on. So usually what I do for that is I just knit a few rows. You know, I have a tail from my original cast on that I can use to kind of just stitch those two rows or, th you know, what is it, like four or six rows, something like that. Um, that I can just stitch those back up. I usually do work it flat because it's just less headachy. There are um, tubular cast-ons for casting on in the round, but I just like that one and that's the one I kind of go to. Um, so yeah, and it is provisional. You do have to pick it out, um, but it's not that big of a deal because usually it's a hat and it's only half the number of stitches you're gonna need. So it's not too big of a deal. Not too big of a hassle. Um, and then if I'm doing a hemmed one, I, and Autumn asked about this also. So this kind of like is our transition maybe. Oh, okay, let's, before we do that, Maggie asked about joining in the round. Um, if you have trouble joining in the round or without getting that twist, um, you know, 
there is nothing to say. Lots of times if I'm knitting a fingering weight hat where there's a bunch of stitches, and for example, I'm on a 16 inch circular, um, lots of times I'll just work two or three rounds flat and then join it. You only have to use like one stitch or two. You're gonna have to weave that end in anyway. It only takes a second to whip that closed and work your, you know, then hide in your tail. Um, and that way you're, you can see much more clearly if the, if your cast on is twisted. Um, so I do that quite a lot, actually. I do that with socks almost all the time, <laughs> even though it's really just a few stitches. Um, but it's just less fiddly to work flat for those first, first few rounds of ribbing. So lots of times I do it with socks even. Okay, then we'll do provisional cast-ons because that'll kind of take us into brims. Um, so Paper Cracker asked about provisional cast-ons and how to unzip them. She said that she's a left-handed crocheter and she wonders if that has something to do with it. Okay, here is my tip and trick that I stole from Laura Linneman of the Knit Girls. It was like a total light bulb moment when she said this for me. So provision, a crochet provisional cast on is where you're crocheting around your knitting needle. Okay. Crochet is like knitting in that it is, you can rip it out from one end and not the other. So before you start your crocheted provisional cast on, tie a knot in that end of your yarn, like your tail that's going to hang down. And that is not the end you rip out. Okay, however you want to remember it. But for me, what I do is I tie a knot in that before I even start my chain or my slip loop or, slip loop or anything, I tie a knot in that and I know that is not the end I need to rip out. So I do my provisional cast on, I do my hat, I come back to rip out my provisional cast on, I'm like, hmm, which side do I start? Not the one with the knot in it, the other one. And the other one will just zip right open. I totally was like, so thanks Laura Lemon. <laughs> okay, so that takes us into brims. Okay. Autumn Bow asked what provisional, or what, she asked for what cast on I use, I think, um, to do hemmed brims. I almost always use a crocheted provisional cast on. Um, it's just, what I like to use. Now I have in the past, I actually don't like it necessarily, <laughs> but I like it better than the alternative. Um, I have in the past used Judy's Magic cast on and basically just cast onto two separate circular needles. And then you just work off of one and leave the other one inactive. So you might wanna put clips on it or um, some sort of like rubber band or something so the stitches that are live don't slip off. Um, and that is nice because you don't have to rip out a provisional cast on, you don't have to pick up the stitches, but I often don't just, I just don't like having that needle bouncing around because usually I do end up doing it with um, a longer circular needle. And so then it's just kind of like bouncing around the whole time, but it is the easiest way, I think, to do um, a knitted brim that you're going to, knitted brim, a folded brim that you're going to join permanently. That's not just like a full, it's a hemmed brim versus a folded brim. Um, but I just generally don't use it because I just don't like that other needle knocking around. Um, now that I'm using 16 inch circulars, it would be interesting to try it with that method instead um, because you have less needle flapping around, but neither here nor there. I usually just use the provisional one and then I rip it out, pick up those stitches. Often I'll pick up the stitches before I rip it out, but it is a little bit more time consuming. Um, but it's just more convenient while I'm actually knitting, especially on like the Midas hat, which has like 30 rows of brim on like 60 rows of brim. Um, Cause you're living with that other needle for quite some time if you do it with like a Judy's magic. But so that's what I tend to do. And then Sarah also had a question about hemmed brims and that hers were uncomfortably tight or not at all stretchy. Um, the only thing I can say is that either your gauge is just too firm for that yarn. So if you're, if you're 
stocking at fabric does not have any flexibility, then yeah, it's probably going to be uncomfortable. Um, this is a, that's a big amount of stretch, right? Um, and that is, there's no ribbing in that brim. That is an all stockinette brim. Um, so if you're having trouble with them being uncomfortable or inflexible, either your, your, ga your gauge is too firm for that yarn, so you're knitting it too tightly. Um, well, that's the problem if it's inflexible. Um, or the, it could be the yarn itself. So like certain yarns have less, less um, flexibility, have less stretch in them than others. So if, for example, you're knitting in a cotton yarn, that's problematic um, for that kind of brim. Uh, but my guess is that the probably is just too firm of a gauge. It's possible that you also, if it's not that it's not stretching, but just that it's not feeling comfortable on your head, it is possible that you've knit just slightly too small of a size. Um, usually I knit my hats a little bit bigger than even sometimes the large size because I don't like my hats to be tight on my head. Now, if I'm out doing yard work or something like that, I'll pick a hat that has less, that has negative ease versus positive ease. Do you want to play with Ducky Momo? This toy is like as old as our little Olive was and it's now Gus's favorite and it is so gross. But it's the only t toy that he has not like completely destroyed is Ducky Momo. Um, so like if I'm outside and I'm doing work or if like we're going sledding or something like that, I'll pick a hat that has negative ease that's going to really stay on my head. Uh, but for hats like inside, either I want very minimal negative ease or sometimes even positive ease. So then let's talk about um, eaves in hats. Uh, and I apologize, I didn't write down who asked this question, so that is... I apologize, um, but I know somebody did ask a question. And so I kind of like a lot of variability in my hats in terms of ease because, uh, again, if I'm outside working or I'm doing sledding or something active, I want something that's gonna be snugger fit on my head. But for example, this is a 22 inch hat. The one that I'm wearing right now is a 22 inch hat and I have about a 22 inch head, maybe 22 and a quarter. It depends on how big headed I am at the, day, at the moment. So for my hats that I wear inside, I kind of joke that if it doesn't look like a baby sweater, <laughs> then I'm probably not going to like it. <laughs> so again, this one is actually like in a relaxed state even is 22 inches, this Ricky hat. Um, so that means it's going to stretch way bigger than that when it's on. It, it can stretch much bigger than that. Um, this hat though which fits me a bit more snugly, which I would wear outside to do work, is 21 inches. So it has about an inch of negative ease, um, but it is very flexible as well. So that's generally how I do it. My husband who wears his hats, again, like this, this way, he does not, he wants his hat to be almost exactly the same circumference as his head because he doesn't really want his hat to be tight on his head. He wants his hat to be largely supported, like the weight of his hat to be largely supported by the crown of his head. And so the, any snugness here is just to keep it from slipping this way. So does that make sense? The alternative being like if you have ribbing here and slouchiness up here or like the hats that actually stick up, then they're all supported. The weight of the hat is supported by how it's, a fun how it's attaching to your head. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and then I apologize I didn't write you down because I did a screen capture of your question and it, your name was above the screen capture. Uh, but she asked about flat caps or a hat that looks basically like a flat cap. So it's a hat that has something put into the brim for rigidity. I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, and then you have a more technical question about that hat that I just could not answer. Um, but the only thing I've, I've knit, I think one or two, like when I first started, like a long, many moons ago, and I think they were felted even. But um, what I would suggest is that there is interfacing that you can get like at Joann's. I don't know where else, I don't know if like a Walmart sewing would not have it because it's, it's a little bit more specific. 
Um, and it's like a decorator's interfacing, and it's it's pretty rigid. It's still it's still a flexible, um, so it's not like for example as rigid like as a like a placemat because that's a thing that sometimes people use is to cut out placemats like to make mitten blockers or what have you. I had some up there, but I don't see them now. Um, so that's like a it's flexible but rigid, it's sharp on the edges. This is a similar flexibility, slightly more flexible probably, uh, but it was going to have a softer edge that you wouldn't be worried about it maybe wearing out the yarn or you know being pokey and pointy on your head. Um, and I don't know what it's called, but that's where I would look. I would go to my Joanne Fabrics, look in their interfacing section, ask the lady, the person at the counter, what they have that would work, and they'll probably point you in the right direction. Okay, so then let's talk about the body of the hat. Um, Shelly asked, how long did knit before your decreases? That is, that is totally personal preference. Um, most of my slouchy hats, I knit about nine inches before I do my decreases. Um, it just is really up to personal preference. This might, this um, thermal is only probably, let's see, I can't exactly, it's not as easy to tell where the D, but this one's probably only about eight inches. Um, so it's really up to you. Again, my husband who wants his hats like up on his head, I only might need to knit an inch beyond the, well, so that'd probably be like five or six inches. Um, it's just, that's such a personal preference that I could, what I would suggest is getting, um, like, um, just going and looking for free patterns and just comparing and contrasting about fits and what they suggest, uh, in terms of like how long you're knitting before your decreases, because it also depends on how quickly you decrease. Um, <clears throat> Some hats have a very flat decrease top, while other ones are going to have, you know, your hats that, have, like, are, for lack of a better description, are the nipple hats that stick up that I want to knit really bad right now, um, are going to have a slower decrease rate, so there's going to be more room in the, It's just, it's too many variables, so I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, oh, and then Shelly asked about negative ease. I'm oh, sorry, Shelly, I talked about that in Brims, but you heard me. If you didn't, go back. <laughs> Debbie asks, um, if a hat keeps crawling up your head, is it too small or too large? I would say it's probably too small. Um, if it's too, like, and the reason I say that is because the hats that I have that are too large don't do that. They just kind of rest on my glasses and, like, spin. They tilt, when you look up, they go back. When you look down, they go down. Um, but I would say that it's probably too tight. It's also possible that it's just too short, um, um, and, or a combination of the two, but I would say it's probably too small. Um, do, 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 do. Molly asks how to make hats stay over your ears. I've never had this problem. So Molly, I don't know. And she said that she has knit, um, knit them longer and done lots of different things. And she just... I don't have that problem, I think because of, like I wear my hats at an angle and so they tend to just stay over my ears. I don't know, I apologize. My suggestion would be maybe to try like a, a hat that has an actual ear, like short row shaping for ears. So like the 1898 hat or the um, Cornus hat by Wooly Wormhead. There's lots of different ones that have kind of ear dips. Um, but I don't know, I've never had that problem. The only thing I can think of is, again, that it's the, the way that you specifically wear your hat, whether you're wearing it straight. Because if you're wearing it straight, like, for it to cover your ears, it has to cover your eyes. Like, because of where, you're, you know, your ears are, like, in the same line. Um, so that's the only thing I can think of. Tilt your hat back, maybe. I don't know. So then let's talk about the crown. Okay, the most popular question was general rules for decreases. How do you do decreases? When, you know, like at what rate do you do the decreases? I'm not an expert. I generally just follow a pattern. And you're right. Some patterns do it and it decrease every other round until the end. Some of them do a decrease every other round until you got like 30% of your stitches left and then they start decreasing every round. Some hats decrease every fourth round, but decrease a lot more. The general 
rule of thumb, general rule of thumb for a hat that has a traditional fit. So like a hat that actually is like, <laughs> not a slouchy hat, not a nipple hat, a hat that fits on your head like that, is that it's essentially a cylinder with a flat top, okay? And to get that, essentially then, that's just a circle, right? The top of the cylinder is just a circle. Um, so to get that, essentially, the rule of thumb is that you're decreasing four stitches each round. Now that might mean you decrease four stitches every round. It might de mean you decrease eight stitches every other round. It might mean you decrease 10 stitches every other round until you're 30% done and then you decrease 10 stitches each round. It's totally, you know, but the average for that style of hat is about four stitches in it per round. Now, in general, again, I'm not an expert. I just follow a pattern. Um, but Wooly Wormhead, always an amazing resource for hats. She is the hat resource, in my opinion. Um, in terms of like technical aspects, variability of construction, if you're looking for a pattern that does something different, you want to use a new technique, you know, her patterns are expensive. They're not bargain basement patterns, uh, but they are always of excellent quality. She does have free patterns out there if you want to try her out first. Um, but she has Crown Shaping Masterclass. So if you just Google Wooly Wormhead, it's two O's, two L's, Crown Shaping Masterclass, it will come up and she is giving it to you for free on her blog. What? Are you kidding me? She talks about the mathematics of why that general rule of thumb for four stitches per round for hats that look essentially like that. Again, it's a flexible fabric. It, sh it stretches to fit your round head. Um, why that is the case. She gives you the mathematics of that and therefore the mathematics of how you would do other shapes. She gives you like the tam, the beret, tam slash beret, excuse me. Uh, what does she call them? Pixie hats. Oh, that's better than nipple hat. Sorry, universe. She talks about the pixie hat and that rate of decrease and how that changes. It's all just a function of gauge. But yeah, pretty much it's there for you. Amazing. Great resource. Um, AKA Greenhouse asks for the secret to the swirl. So, you know, some like you'll see it mostly in plain stockinette hats. You get that swirl. You know, sometimes you'll see it on berets or tams. All that is is just doing one directional. So either you're doing an SSK or an two together, but you're staying with one of those decreases evenly spaced. That's all that is. It'll make it swirl like that. Versus like a mitered where you're doing like a toe, basically like toe decreases four places um, or whatever. Antoinette asks, Oh, wait, sorry. Mindy asks, knitting top down. Okay, so this one is beyond my scope, I think. Mindy asks, knitting top down, how to incorporate stitch patterns um, as close to the top as possible. Is there a formula, recipe, template? I put that out to you. Is that out there? Do you guys know? Mindy, check the notes. Um, Antoinette asks, how to have crown decreases of ribbed beanie, not point? Okay. As, uh, that's that's a paraphrase. I'm sure hers was much more eloquently spoken. Um, uh, I'll follow a pattern. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so true. I will just follow a pattern. Uh, but I will say this: it's part of it is a function of your rigid your gait your. It's not your gauge, but your fabric. If your fabric is very rigid, and I understand sometimes I want to knit a rigid hat because it's, I'm, I think it's going to be more windproof, or I think it's going to be, there's a reason to do it. Uh, but ribbing, when it's really rigid like that, does have a tendency to pucker and not, again, you're knitting a shape that is essentially a cylinder to fit a sphere-ish thing. So that's what you're essentially knitting. And if that fabric is not flexible, then you're going to get that shape or you're gonna get the pixie shape depending on your rate of decrease. Um, 
So my suggestion is just, and I apologize, it's not a good suggestion, um, but it's just to look at free patterns out there. If you're not wanting to invest in a pattern, I looked and there are several free um, ribbed patterns that have lovely flat crowns, um, but it might also be just a, a function of gate of your fabric if your fabric is too rigid if it doesn't have a lot of flexibility um, it's going to be harder for those shapes to then mold over a head um, usually the nipple is because you've got you're trying to decrease to too many stitches like if you're trying to decrease down to four stitches you're more likely to get that nippling effect um, or if you're putting you know if your rate of decrease is, is off of that four stitches per round but that would be my suggestion. Um, Eileen asks how to close the top. I just, I just use them like, I just do it like everybody else does. I just um, put my end on a tapestry needle and go through the loops. But I usually do do it once, pull it snug, go around again, pull snug again, go around again. I usually do go around at least twice. Uh, but often three times because that is a tendency and I always leave a very long end on that uh, on the this part because it is a tendency if you've not caught them through twice for that little for lack of a better word for that little sphincter to open up um, so I do stitch through them at least twice uh, sometimes three times and then I leave a good tail to weave in it's inside the hat you don't even have to weave the whole thing in let there be a strand inside your hat it's fine um, so yeah, that's what I do. So, and this hat is, this hat has that where it's, and it's a, a Saji hat. So it has a slight, it has a faster decrease rate. So it's even more kind of tension or pressure on that. And it's, it's, and I've worn this hat so many times. It's ridiculous and it's super wash and it has stayed fine. Um, so yeah, that's all I do. But you can see that I have a fairly long end and it's loose. I only wove it in about halfway and then the rest is just hanging out there just in case later on it loosens up and I need to snug it up again. But yeah, that's usually what I do. Yep, this one is a million years old too. Same thing. It's a looser gauge and a slightly um, less abrupt decrease, but it's still looking good all these years. So yeah. Um, do, 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 do. That kind of takes us into finishing. Uh, the, the other question I did not get that I was kind of surprised I did not get, and now I don't have anything to show you with, I'm sorry, is pom-poms, right? Pom-poms. Okay, my general rule of thumb for pom-poms is to make the pom-poms, to so do the wrapping, until you think you're done, and then do at least that much again. So always make the pom-pom twice as thick as you think it needs to be, sometimes three times. General rule of thumb. You cannot make the pom-pom too thick. It's impossible. Okay, I'm sure it's possible, but I've never had that problem. So again, rule of thumb, make it as thick as you think it needs to be, then do that much again. It's ridiculous. But the big thing that people have trouble with is um, getting them to stay on, especially when you get those really luscious, plump pom-poms, is getting them to stay on your hat, especially if it's a slouchy hat. Um, when it's on top of your head, it, you know, gravity's helping you keep that pom-pom attached. But when it's a slouchy hat like this and the pom-pom is back here, it just wants to keep falling down. Um, and so generally what I do is sew a button. I sew, I put a, so let's pretend this is the button. I put a button inside the crown and then I sew the pom-pom down through the hat, you know, through the whole of the button up to the other. So the, the hat is just in between the pom-pom and the button. The button is anchoring the pom-pom down. And that is my, I've never had a problem with pom-pom not staying on that way. And also it makes you feel like you can tie it tighter because you're not tying it to your beautifully knitted hat. You're just tying it to some button that you got like, cause it fell off of something else, you know. Uh, and you do need a, a good size button obviously cause if you're usually using your thread to tie a pom-pom down versus like a button where you're using sewing thread. But you, there's no reason you can't use sewing thread to tie a pom-pom down. I'm saying the word pom-pom way too much. Um, so if you don't, you know, if you can't get a button that's not like, you know, it's just not convenient, you can certainly sew them down with thread. Um, not a problem at all. But yeah, the button is the way to go. Finishing. 
finishing. Paige asks, how do I block hats? Do you use a plate? Do you lay them flat? She doesn't really like those results. Um, I just lay them flat on the heating vent. <laughs> now I do typically, um, you know how the, the directions for blocking things are like, soak them, put them in a towel, roll them up, press gently, never ring. I ring the pants out of my hats, like out of basically everything, Maybe not sweaters, uh, just because they're too big, uh, but I wring the water. I just am merciless. I just wring all the water out. And I find that that way, and I put them to lay flat on a, a heating vent, they don't tend to, I mean, they'll have a slight crease, but it goes away as soon as you put it on your head. Um, I have in the past blocked some hats um, by using like a canister and then just putting a towel over it and then putting the hat on that. Um, and then you, of course you can use washcloth or whatever to kind of bunch up if you, if you really want the hat crown stretched out to a specific shape or what have you. You know, you can put some towels in there to kind of create like a little mold. Um, I have done that in the past, but generally I just wring them out. You can use a salad spinner. Um, I usually do that if I have multiple things because it's on a very high shelf. Uh, but salad spinners work great to get lots of water out. And that's only to say that I think the less water that's in the hat before you start the drying process, the least likely you are to have those creases and things. So that's my suggestion. Um, Sandy asks, do the ends ever pop out uh, on my hats? And I would say, no, I just leave a really long end. And I usually leave the last bit of it un unwoven in. There's, I don't have, there's no reason to try to make it perfectly because it's inside your hat. I mean, unless your hat's reversible, then that's a whole different set of ball of wax or something. But generally I just leave an extra end that's not, like I weave in an inch and then I leave a couple inches, an inch, couple inch strand that's not woven in and that way it'll never come out of the hat. You'll be fine. And then, yeah, that's it, right? I feel like that was a lot of me talking in a very dry fashion, but Q&A, yo. Sometimes that's what it is. So anyway, I hope you found it helpful. Again, everything with a grain of salt. There's gonna be more suggestions in the drop down. Um, just check that out. I'm sure there'll be great hits, uh, other great tips and trip, trips and tips and tricks. Not tips and trips, maybe some trips. That's okay. We all trip sometimes. Um, but you might want to check there. And then I'll try to maybe do like a tidy up or a roundup at the beginning of the actual like hat show and tell episode. Um, so we'll put some additional information there. But yeah, the next one will be mostly, these are the hats I like, I like. These are the hats I like. Um, look, it's in the hall for you. I hope you have a great week. Okay, I gotta stop saying that. I hope you have great moments in your week. I hope you enjoy your making. And I'll talk next time. Bye.